Hey everyone, welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I wanna to talk about all the books that I read in April. In April, I read 12 books. I read a lot of short books this past month. I kind of set aside the, the longer books that I usually go for. I usually try to read at least one very long book every month, but this month I decided to just stick with short books, and it was a lot of fun uh, because I read a lot of, I think, more varied books than I usually do in a month. And I also found that a lot of these really short books were just as powerful as the longer books that I usually read. I read a lot of really good books this past month, past month and I'm very excited to talk about them. So let's just dive into it. The first book I read was To Live by Yu Hua. This was recommended to me when in my 1000 subscriber Q&A video, I talked about how I wanted to read more contemporary Chinese literature. My friend Ryan recommended Yu Hua as he's one of the more famous uh, contemporary Chinese novelists. And this was a great book. It's an incredibly moving book about the, the fall of a single man. But there are all these allusions to greater Chinese political history, many of which I probably missed, to be fair. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I didn't do a full um, single review of this book. I felt like I missed a lot of the, the allusions to Chinese uh, politics and Chinese history. But essentially what this book is, is it's set up as a frame narrative of this man who is going through the Chinese countryside, interviewing farmers, sort of Brothers Grimm style, and gathering their songs and their stories and their tales. And he comes across this very destitute man who is sitting out in the field with his ox, and that's all he owns. And he begins talking to this man, and this man tells this incredible tale. See, this man is called Fu Gui, and he tells this story of his life, and that's the meat of this book, is the story of Fu Gui's life. And he was born into a very, very rich family, um, was insanely privileged. He would literally ride on the back of servants to school. He would, he would climb onto their back and they, they would carry him all the way to school. But he tells this story of basically this, this fall from grace. As now he's as we see in the first couple of pages, he's entirely destitute. He's all alone and the only thing he owns is this single ox. But the narrative of Fu Gui sort of mirrors the history of, of China, basically throughout the second half of the kind of mid part of the 20th century. And all these big events sort of happen in the background, but Fu Gui is often pulled into these event, events. Like at one point he's drafted into the army and is forced to fight in the civil war. And I won't get into too many details here because I don't want to spoil it, but later in life he comes back from this war and he, he has a family and the cultural revolution is happening in the background. And he begins just suffering tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. This book is full of suffering. <laughs> But there is this, this stoicism throughout this book, and I know stoicism isn't the right word, but it's the only word I can think of right now. As Fugue takes on all of these tragedies, all of this suffering with this dignity. Fugue suffers throughout this book, but he persists, even if it's just him and his ox. So to live is really just heartfelt and beautiful, and it raises the suffering of this single man to the suffering of the entire nation, or at least I think that's what it's attempting to do. It reads at times like a parable, but it's never distant like a parable. The prose is actually gorgeous, and the story is very intimate and sympathetic to Fu Gui. And it's really just a beautiful book about tragedy and about persisting through tragedy. And I mean, it says a lot that when this book was initially published, it was censored by the Chinese government, as there's really little in this book that's outwardly political. It's really just about the dignity of humanity. But this is, this is very much a social realist novel, sort of in the vein of in the West, um, authors like um, Knut Hampson, Haldor Laxness, John Steinbeck, and that ilk. But I found it to be much more intimate than a lot of those novels are. And yeah, I mean, it's really just a beautiful book. It, it's really, really quite good. Um, I just felt like I missed a lot of the, um, I could tell he was doing a lot with the history of China and um, all this stuff kind of happening in the background that I think I missed. So I didn't feel comfortable making a full review of it, um, but absolutely great book. Thanks for the recommendation, Ryan. I will definitely be more, be reading more you in the future. The next book I read is The Plains by Gerald Murnane. And this is a book that I've already done a full review of um, and I absolutely loved. Um, Murnane is a writer that I'm increasingly fascinated with. 
this won't be the last you'll hear of him in, in this month, um, nor in the future. I'll be reading much more Murnane as time goes on. And I won't say too much about it here as I already made a full video of it, but I think this is a pretty good starting place for Murnane. The narrative is rather simple, at least on the face of it. It's just about a guy who goes inland to the plains of Australia to study the plains and to study the plains men who live there because he's making a film about the interior. But throughout, throughout the story, we see that it's really, the planes are embedded with this kind of mysticism that our narrator is searching for. And by the way, if you're looking for a dissertation idea, um, here's a free dissertation idea. I think someone could write a really interesting comparative analysis of the mysticism expressed in the fictions of Gerald Murnane and the fictions of Jan Fossa. They seem to be searching for a very similar thing, and they go about it in... Pretty similar ways, honestly. But anyways, the sentence level writing of, of Murnane is fantastic, and especially in the planes, that's, that's on full display. Um, if you want more, go watch my review in which I read um, a lot from the book, perhaps too much, people say too much. Um, I just don't know how you review a book without reading from the text itself. But anyways, uh, it's a fantastic book, fantastic place to start with Murnane if you're interested in him. Um, and. Yeah, expect more Murnane in the future. The next book that I read was White Mythology by W.D. Clark, which has just recently, just about a month ago, been republished by the press Corona Samizdat with a brand new cover that is absolutely gorgeous. But this book is really two novellas, or one novel and one novella. The, the first novella is Skinner Box, and it's really a full novel. It's like over 300 pages. And the second novella is much shorter, and it's called Love's Alchemy. And just for the sake of transparency, this book was sent to me by W.D. Clark himself, which I was very gracious to receive um, as I, I was excited to read it anyways, and he offered to send a copy, so that was pretty cool. This book was really just a lot of fun. I keep trying to think of different ways to describe it, and I keep coming back to just how fun it really was. Um, it had one of the funniest narrators that I, I read recently. Think of um, Sergio de la Pava, or even Thomas Pynchon. I mean, the, the epigraph to this book is, is a Thomas Pynchon quote from Gravity's Rainbow. So he's very much in that, that postmodern, for lack of a better word, I guess, that postmodern narration that's often whimsical and funny and ironic um, and that I, I really do like. And Clark uses it very, very effectively, um, especially in the first no novel or novella, Skinner Box, which I'll talk about a bit more at length than Love's Alchemy. Skinner Boxed takes place sometime in the 90s in Canada, and it follows this psychiatrist named Dr. Ed, who has a PhD in behavioral sciences. And as I'm sure you can tell by that and the fact that it's called Skinner Boxed, this novel is very interested in conditioning and behaviorism and modern psychiatry. And throughout the novel, we watch as Dr. Ed diagnoses all of these, all of these patients. But what's much more interesting, in my opinion, is how well, Dr. Ed is also in a box, and we are diagnosing him as we, as we read this book. We are, in some ways, as readers, a, uh, psychiatrists, as we are meant to, you know, note behavioral patterns, analyze the connections between them, and diagnose them. And what we're really diagnosing throughout white mythology are the, the, the dominant ideologies that the West really runs on, especially masculinity. At the beginning of Skinner Box, Dr. Ed's life is sort of turning on, on its head. Um, his wife has this like shopping addiction and she keeps disappearing. Um, Dr. Ed has this long lost son that he didn't know existed that just reappears back in his life and begins working in his office with him. Basically, Dr. Ed is losing control, which he really shouldn't be. As a behavioral scientist, as long as people are functioning according to material causality, he should be able to predict how people are acting um, or why they're acting the way that they are. And he gets kind of annoyed when people act outside of this. He has a problem with free will. And on top of all of this, Dr. Ed is working with these researchers to develop this new, this new drug called ALBA, which is supposed to suppress feelings of guilt and burden and loss. But that's enough of the plot. What I really liked about the, the, these, these novels, these novellas, is just how ironic and funny the, the narrator was. See, Dr. Ed is a bit of a prat, and 
The narrator is also a bit of a jerk in a different way, but it leads to these really funny scenes that really undermine Dr. Ed's perception of the world. For instance, pretty early on, his wife makes this list for some reason of all the things that, that Dr. Ed dislikes. She clearly likes to mess with them, and it's pretty clear from early on that they don't get along too, too well. But so she makes the, this long list of all these things that, that Dr. Ed doesn't like, and it ends with this list of people. Spiritual people, street people, fat people, loud people, bald people, messy people, immigrant people, foreign people, old people, young people, little people, sick people, weak people, other people, people, him, her, them, us, this. And then this list is followed by this chapter in which Dr. Ed kind of goes against all of these and he goes, I'm not bigoted, I don't hate other people at all. Um, and it ends with this, uh, or doesn't end with, it includes this, this paragraph that I really like that is just so ironic. But it just reads, But that list of his wife's was a cruel low blow, wasn't it? If his wife felt all warm and fuzzy about the homeless, well, that was just swell and super terrific. Well done. But a more honest person would admit that one didn't always feel that way. Or take aggressive females, which was also on that list. That was supposed to signify that Dr. Ed was a was a misogynist, but nothing could be further from the truth. For truth is born out of behavior, not by inclination. And Dr. Ed had always behaved most professionally towards any female, aggressive or not, and had treated with dignity and respect all of the patients and colleagues, be they male or female, and for that matter, Chinese or Hindu. No, Dr. Ed's behavior was impeccably gender, as well as race, blind. Clearly a lot of irony going on there, and in fact, just on the next page, Dr. Ed calls a woman shrill and begins to make sexist comments. Never mind the direct reference to him being a, a colorblind racist, which is all too prominent in a neoliberal world. So Skinner Box is really a really interesting character study, but I really like this layer of having a, a very different narrator on top of that. The, the narrator is his own character in a way. And in fact, I, I was speaking to um, W.D. Clark about this, and he actually said that, quote, the, the narrator is even worse at being phallogocentric than Dr. Ed himself. And I think that's exactly right. But this addition of this narrator just adds another layer to, to irony that is just an absolute joy to read. It makes, it makes the book so much more fun. But perhaps more importantly, it also makes us question who is in control of this narrative. There's this moment where uh, Dr. Ed gets angry with his wife for her shopping addiction and kind of characterizes her in a specific way. And at the end of that chapter, we get this little, this little bit that I, I, I just like so much. Perhaps, perhaps. Perhaps too, we should not sketch her as Dr. Ed has in such broad strokes. Perhaps there is simply, there is simply more to her than is being suggested. Perhaps it is just not true that there's no there there. Hmm, perhaps. But again, her behavior suggests otherwise. And perhaps Dr. Ed, moreover, shouldn't be made out to be some kind of simpleton, some kind of caricature, some archetypal derivative, some mutant species of egghead or caveman, perhaps. But he did say the things recorded here. He did, in fact, utter them. And since we can never really get inside the minds of other people, since we can only pretend to know what drives them, to discover what causes, explains, and ultimately excuses their actions, all we have to go on, to quote the man himself, is their behavior. Everything else is, well, fiction, isn't it? So yeah, it's a pretty great book that I would recommend. I do think a lot of it, some of it went over my head as there's clearly a lot of uh, Derrida going on in here, a lot of deconstruction going on. And some of that I think passed over my head, which is also why I didn't make a full review of this because I didn't fully, I don't think I fully got what was going on though I enjoyed the ride immensely. If you enjoy that kind of postmodern narrative style, um, I think you'll enjoy this. Let's go, go check out coronasamas.press if you, if you want to. All right, the next book I read was Duplex by Katherine Davis. I read the first part of Katherine Davis's ongoing um, memoir, Aurelia Aurelia, last uh, month and I said that I wanted to get into her fiction and a lot of people actually recommended Duplex as a good place to start. And I heard that this book was weird and it was weird. <laughs> This book takes place in a, an indescript American suburb. It appears to be unexceptionally ordinary, 
But then we slowly kind of move in and we slowly start to realize that things aren't quite what they seem. We start to realize that on this cul-de-sac in this American suburb, some of these people aren't actually people. They're actually robots and others are like wizards and stuff. And so, yeah, it gets really surreal really quickly. But what's particularly interesting or disturbing is that people have difficulty telling apart who is human and who is a robot. It's very kind of Black Mirror-esque in a lot of ways, but it was done exceptionally well. And what made it so exceptional was Davis's writing style, which I think is just absolutely gorgeous, um, which is something that it shares with the, the memoir that I read last month. That was why I wanted to read more of her writing, because her sentence level writing was brilliant. But just listen to this description of a night sky. They were no longer in the tunnel, but in a clearing, an immense meadow that appeared to have been recently mowed and was dotted with several large haystacks, the whole thing surrounded by cedar trees. It was as if the narrow space they'd been in had suddenly swelled, and the cedars along with it, the wall, the wall of trees getting thinner and thinner and moving farther and farther away, like a balloon being blown up. When she thought about it, Mary realized she couldn't remember ever coming out of the tunnel. The sky, on the other hand, didn't look anything like the sky had looked before. It was as immense as the meadow, with a strangely bulging uh, sliver of moon and loads of falling stars. The wind began to blow. And so this book is just replete with these just fantastic descriptions. Again, her sentence of the writing is, is great. And I'm not even going to touch the plot. It's, it's wacky and... I mean, it's, it's very much uh, literary sci-fi, and it's very surreal, and it's disorientating to read, um, which is part of the fun. But it's difficult to put your finger on anything, because everything just becomes more and more unreal as you keep reading. So yeah, I enjoyed it. It definitely wasn't my favorite. I think, again, if, if you're more into sci-fi and speculative fiction, you might like it more than me. I found it a bit too, a bit, a bit too uh, disorientating um, for, for, for my tastes, but... You might like it better. The next two books I read were by Ariana Harwitz, the first, first of which is Die My Love. Um, I've already done a review of this book, so I'll be brief here. I think Die My Love is absolutely fantastic. If you're into psychological thrillers or psychological horror novels, um, you need to pick this up. It's a thrilling book to read, but it's really, again, the I know I keep saying the writing style over and over again, it's really the writing style that makes this book as beautiful as it is, because the images and the metaphors that are used are haunting, and disturbing, um, and, and gorgeous. It follows this new mother in rural France uh, as she is living with her young kid and her husband and her mother-in-law, and she's suffering from something, probably something like postpartum depression, but she is sort of dealing with a kind of mania. She's really struggling mentally, and she begins imagining all of these well, very violent situations in which she kills her family. Um, and, and, so, and so her dreams and, and her reality begin blending. So this is also very disorientating to read, as you're not quite sure what's real, what isn't real, what's going to happen. It seems like something big is, something's going to explode. Um, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, I would I would highly highly recommend this one. Go check out my review if you want um, if you want to learn more about it. But then the next book that I read was uh, Feeble Minded, which these these two books and a, a third book which I haven't gotten to yet um, make up what Ariana Harwitz calls her involuntary trilogy, and that these books are connected, but they they're more thematically connected rather than narratively connected. This book, just like Die My Love is very much about motherhood. But in Feeble Minded, it's much more focused on uh, a mother-daughter relationship. And in here, there's just as much violence, just as much imagined violence, and a bit more sex than in Die My Love. And just like in Die My Love, the short staccato chapters and the short staccato sentences work so well to just create I keep, I keep using the phrase, but it, it, uh, it, keep, it creates a whirlwind in which you just can't stop reading because of how short and digestible each sentence and each chapter is. But you're just waiting for the cumulative effect to, to, to explode. And whereas Die My Love felt dreamy and surreal because of the, the, the mental state of the main character, here 
there is this added element of of alcohol as the mother and daughter are on these like self-destructive alcoholic binges. And so their reality obviously begins melting because of alcohol. And yeah, I mean, it, it's just another wild ride from Harwitz. Um, I don't really have too much more to say about it other than I think I liked Die My Love a little bit more, um, but I think that might be because I, I read it first and Feeble Minded does a lot of the same, or doesn't do the same things, but it does a lot of things in a similar way as to uh, as Die My Love. But if you like Die My Love, you'll like Feeble Minded just as much, I think. All right, the next book I read was The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zut by David Mitchell. Now, I've only ever read one other uh, David Mitchell book, which is Cloud Atlas, as, as you can see there. And this is quite different than Cloud Atlas, obviously, but it's similar in that there is just, Mitchell is so good at introducing just a expanding and grand narrative with so many moving pieces and then slowly zooming into each of these, which then just expand each piece. His storytelling technique is very satisfying. This book takes place in Japan around the year 1799, uh, which is the so-called Sokoku period in, in Japanese history. Apologies for mispronouncing that. Um, but it's the isolationist period where Japan has isolated itself off from all Western influences. And so well, we follow this, this character named Jakob de Zut, who is a Dutchman working for the Dutch East India Company. And he is essentially living on this small, artificial, man-made island called Dejima, which is right in Nagasaki Harbor. And it's such a cool island um, because it was basically the only port into Japan uh, for any Westerners. But it has like this very small city on it. Go look up pictures of, of Dejima. It's, it's a really cool artificial island. But so Westerners weren't allowed onto the mainland of Japan at all. So they had to stay in this, in this small kind of separate island. And most of the, at least the first half of this book, all takes place basically in Dejima. And so a large portion of this book is really just about the cultural contact between the West and the Japanese. And it needs to work closely with uh, translators and cultural emissaries. But what's interesting is how Mitchell is like hyper aware of Orientalism, right? In, in the Edward Said sense of the word, because Mitchell is obviously a Westerner writing this, this story. And all the characters in the novel, of course, engage with these Orientalist ideas kind of by necessity. But Mitchell sort of slowly deconstructs them without being dogmatic about it. So much of what I found so interesting about this book was the, the, the cultural contact between Japan and, and the West. But this book also, especially in the latter half, delves into the, the, the fighting between different countries in the West for power over Japan. And there's all these battles between the Portuguese and the English and the Dutch. Um, and all that was, was very, very interesting. There's also a great love story, a lot of really interesting characters. Mitchell is very good at crafting particularly interesting characters. And there's also a lot of conspiracies and some pretty wild conspiracies. So I like David Mitchell, but I'm never quite blown away by him. I do realize that I need to read more of his books because apparently they're all like interconnected. Um, I was talking a lot with Fraser Simons of the channel Springboard Thought about this, who has a great video series on each of Mitchell's books and also kind of the, the Mitchell universe in which all of his books take place and how they're interconnected and stuff. Um, and he was assuring me that, that they are all interconnected, but I guess I haven't read enough of them uh, to really see how they're interconnected. This is something that I would usually absolutely love, but I just haven't really been able to fully see it yet. But so The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zut is a, a really good book. I, I have no problems with it, but it just didn't, it didn't blow me away in, in the way that I expect, I always expect David Mitchell to blow me away because of how highly a lot of people talk about him. That being said, I am interested in the kind of greater um, worlds in which he is creating, the greater world that he is creating. So I will be reading more of him in the future, no doubt. And then the next book I, I read, which I'm not really sure why I added here because it's just a collection of essays, is Jan Fosse's An Angel Walks Through the Stage and Other Essays. The reason why I added it is because I actually read it cover to cover, um, which most essay uh, collections, I, I just read you know a few a few essays here and there and kind of dip in and out of. Um, but this, I, I read cover to cover because, well, I, I love Jan Fossa. Um, and I was actually surprised by how much I, I enjoyed this. I didn't realize how interested Fossa is 
in literary theory, or how interested he was in literary theory. I think he's since kind of given up on literary theory, but there's a lot of essays in here that focus on Derrida and Adorno and, and Foucault and all this different stuff that was, after reading Septology and reading a bunch of his other works, was really interesting to see him just get down to the nitty gritty of, of literary theory. But yeah, I mean, I don't have that much else to say about this. Um, if you're interested in Jan Fossa, I think it's definitely worth picking up because he, again, he talks about Joyce, Beckett, Gnosticism. Um, this essay in here called Negative Mysticism is fantastic. Um, he talks about the novel and what it's supposed to be doing. He talks about writing at like the, the sentence level. Um, he talks about how you know, he wanted to become a teacher, but then didn't want to become a teacher, um, and then became a teacher and hated it. Um, if you're interested in Jan Fossa, it's, it's a must read, I think. But yeah, I mean, I don't really have too much else to say about it. All right, and then I read Perfume by Patrick Suskind. And this book was fantastic. This was kind of recommended to me by Andre at the Untranslated blog, who in one of his reviews for another book just noted that this book changed historical fiction forever. So I was immediately intrigued. And I do have to say that this book is just great. It's a historical fiction or historical fantasy novel that takes place in 18th century France. And it reimagines 18th century France in such a unique and just brilliant way. It begins with the birth of Jean-Baptiste Grenouille, who is born into a world that, well, stinks. This book is so much about scent and smell. And Suskind uh, writes about scent in a way that I've never read another author uh, write about it. He writes about it so damn well. Um, let me just read the second paragraph of this book. In the period of which we speak, there reigned in the cities a stench barely conceivable to us modern men and women. The streets stank of manure, the courtyards of urine, the stairwells sank, stank of moldering wood and rat droppings, the kitchen of spoiled cabbage and mutton fat, the unaired parlors stank of stale dust, the bedrooms of greasy sheets, damp feather beds, and the pungently sweet aroma of chamber pots. The stench of sulfur rose from the chimneys, the stench of caustic lot lies from the tanneries, and from the slaughterhouses came the stench of congealed blood. People stank of sweat and unwashed clothes. From their mouths came the stench of rotting teeth, from the bellies that of onions, and from their bodies, if they were no longer very young, came the stench of rancid cheese and sour milk and tumorous disease. The rivers stank, the marketplace stank, the churches stank. It stank beneath the bridges and in the palaces. The peasants stank as the priest did, the apprentices as did the master's wife. The whole aristocracy stank. Even the king himself stank, stank like a rank lion, and the queen like an old goat, summer and winter. For in the 18th century, there was nothing to hinder bacteria busy at decomposition. And there was no human activity, either constructive or, de or destructive, destructive, no manifestation of germinating or decaying life that was not accompanied by stench. <laughs> and... Again, he keeps coming back to scent throughout this entire book. And I just adore the prose of this novel. It's, it's lush and so visceral. But this focus on stench isn't just visceral and gritty and gross. It's essential to the plot and the themes of the book. See, Jean-Baptiste Grenouille, when he's born, has no stench. He, no one can smell him. And so people around him... Uh, take him for a demon or the devil. And so he gets passed around a lot in his youth. But as Grenouille grows up, he realizes that he can smell better than anyone else in the world. He can smell everything almost perfectly. That is, he can tell the difference between like two different lavender plants, whereas we would smell it and think it's lavender. To him, both of those smells register completely differently in his nose. And this just reminds me so much of a Borges short story. It actually reminds me most specifically of the short story Funes the Memorius, who basically remembers every single memory he ever had. And he has to like classify them and categorize them in his own mind as independent. And this kind of drives him insane. In Perfume, Grenouille isn't driven insane, but he's driven to obsession with creating the perfect scent. He begins to work for a perfumer and he begins curating the, the, the perfect scents 
for, for everyone. And particularly, he becomes obsessed with the scent of particular prepubescent girls right on the cusp of puberty. And he becomes obsessed with them, and as the subtitle to this book explains, this is the story of a murderer. So you can probably see where this is going. He wants to collect these scents and preserve them before they're spoiled by puberty. It's really quite gross. But I think that Seusskind is, is really getting at society's infatuation with virginal girls and prepubescent girls that we still have today, but they had especially prominent in the 18th century. It's very disturbing in the exact same way that Lolita by Nabokov is disturbing. But this book really is just incredible. The focus on scent and smell is so unique, but Suskind doesn't use it just as a gimmick or something like that, but is able to fully ingrain it into a psychological thriller and explore the relationships between scent and society, but also scent and memory. And this all makes a lot of sense. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I go to like Target and walk through the candle section, every now and then I'll get a whiff of a candle and it'll immediately bring me back to my childhood or to a, a specific memory associated with that scent. And it's really, this book is really about the power that scent holds over the human brain. And Grenouille realizes this and he wants to harbor this power. As I said, he begins to work at a perfumer and begins to make these perfumes. But he doesn't want to make these perfumes to sell them for money. He wants to make these perfumes so he can control people. He thinks that if he can make these perfect scents, then, then people will smell it and then they'll love Grenouille, the bearer of these scents. And let me just read th this small excerpt. He writes, Yes, that was what he wanted. They would love him as they stood under the spell of his scent, not just accept him as one of them, but love him to the point of insanity, of self-abandonment, they would quiver with delight, scream, weep for bliss. They would sink to their knees, just as if under God's cold incense, merely to be able to smell him, Grenouille. He would be the omnipotent God of scent, just as he had been in his fantasies, but this time in the real world and over real people. And he knew that all this was within his power, for people could close their, their eyes to greatness, to horrors, to beauty, and their ears to melodies or deceiving words, but they could not escape scent, for scent was a, was a brother of breath. Together with breath, it entered human beings who could not defend themselves against it, nor if they wanted to live, and scent entered into their very core, went directly to their hearts, and decided for good, and all between affection and contempt, disgust and love, dis disgust and lust, love and hate. He who ruled scent ruled the hearts of man. This one is really great, guys. I really, really recommend it. And the ending of this book is absolute insanity. One of the best endings to a book that I've read. I'll definitely be reading more Seusskind in the future, and I'll be recommending this one for a while. And apparently this was actually Kurt Cobain's favorite novel, if that means anything to you. Um, I really recommend this book. I think it's great. The next book I read was Another Murnane, Barley Patch. I read this for the Spinecrackers podcast, which they very generously invited me on, and that episode should be live uh, this week. So if you wanna hear more of my thoughts on Barley Patch, um, do check out that episode, because I quite liked Barley Patch, and the other hosts didn't like it as much, but it led to a, a I think, more fruitful discussion, because we had some disagreements. But it was a great conversation, and they're a great podcast full of, of wit and humor and also literary insight. Um, so go check that out. But I'll be brief here. Barley Patch came out in 2009, and it's the beginning of the second half of Murnane's career. He gave up writing fiction sometime in the, the mid-90s. He, he said he was never going to write another book. Um, and then he came out 14 years later with Barley Patch. And what Barley Patch really is, is a narrator who is very similar to Murnane. He's also a writer who used to write and read books, and then he gave up writing. And it's about this, this narrator who is thinking back onto why he wrote. The first words of this book are, are a quote from Rilke that just says, must I write? And so he's really interrogating why he ever wrote and why does he need to write again? But what this book really explores is these memories of writing and reading fiction. And the narrator just really delves into these memories of, of reading where he imagines himself 
within these stories of the books that he read. And they kind of become part of, of his memories. And he can't really tell the difference between his own memories and the memories of those books in which he read. It's really much, it's very much like a, a fictionalization of fiction. Um, but it explores memory and this memory palace that the narrator has created in his head that he likes to explore. He doesn't read any new books. All he wants to do is just explore the books that he's already read in his own head. He wants to just explore those memories. It's a fascinating book that I think worked a lot for me. It didn't work for the other hosts of the Spinecrackers podcast. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure if it's for everyone. I think it's a, a, a book that is probably best read towards the end of um, Murnane's bibliography. I think it probably works better the more Murnane you read before this one. Um, but go check out the Spinecrackers podcast um, and check out the episode that I'm on if you want to hear more of my thoughts or hear um, their thoughts on this book. All right, and just two more that we'll go through quickly. The next book that I read was David Keenan's Extabeth. This is my second Keenan. I read his Monument Maker back in, in January and had pretty mixed feelings about it. Um, and this book is quite similar. This book is very, very short. And I really like his prose style in this. He writes similar to Harwitz in this very staccato, very short sentences. Um, but it's much more bare-boned than, than Harwitz's is. And in the books that I've read by Keenan, but especially this book, he's very interested in, in music and sex. And he, I was trying to think of a way to, to describe his writing style um, to, to someone the other day. And the best I could come up with is that he writes in what I would call like punk postmodernism. And so if you're interested in music or kind of the punk aesthetic, I think you might love Keenan. He doesn't really work too well for me. I was actually reading an interview by him uh, or with him about this book. And he talks about how he admits that this book doesn't really have a point and that he's kind of stopped writing books that have points, which is something that I kind of have mixed feelings about. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to have like, like a, a, a point that you're getting to when writing a book, but I don't know. This book just didn't really seem like it did anything particularly interesting um, for me. The, the characters in many ways feel like they're almost supernatural or ghostly. They're sort of beyond understanding, which I did think that part was cool, and that might kind of be why there is no point, because these characters are kind of beyond comprehension. But I don't really have much to say about this. It's kind of a sci-fi story, and it also feels like it's kind of taking place in like the Twilight Zone or something. I don't know. I think there's a type of reader who would absolutely love everything that Keenan ever wrote um, and would just adore his style um, and his subject matter. It just doesn't really work that well for me. And then the last book that I read was Canzoni di Guerra by Dasha Drindich, which I just put out a review of. Um, I love Drindich. I have more of her books right there. Um, she's fantastic. And this book is very short. It's like 150 pages. And, it, and it's from quite early on in her career. It was originally published in 1998, but it was just translated into English like a month or two ago. And I'll be super brief here because I realize I've been going for way too long. Um, and I've already done a full review of this because I really thought that it deserved its own video. Dasha Drindich is a writer that I really admire. And I really think that more people should be reading. But basically what this book is about is this, this mother, Tia Radan, and her daughter, Sarah, who escaped or kind of emigrated away from Croatia in the mid-90s during the Yugoslav Wars, and they live in Canada. And so this book is really about being an immigrant in Canada, in Toronto specifically, and living among the kind of immigrant communities, while also being very much about the uh, atrocities that happened in the Balkans and in um, in, in Croatia especially, um, from the Ustasha in the 1940s and during the Yugoslav Wars of the 90s. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a song of war in which it remembers the, the victims, it prosecutes the, the actors who did the atrocities, and it is a warning to all the survivors of these atrocities and to the readers to not grow complacent and to continue to be anti-fascist and be actively anti-fascist because something like what happened in the 90s and what happened in the 40s could happen again. But I'll leave it there for now. Go watch my review if you want more. Um, Dasha Drindich is 
a writer that everyone should be uh, should be reading, I think. So yeah, that's all the books that I read in April. Let me know if you've read any of these and what you think of them um, and where I should go from here. A lot of these authors I read kind of for the first time. So if you have any recommendations on where I should go from here, um, let me know down in the comments, but I'd love to just hear your thoughts. Anyways, for now, thanks for watching.